Is that on? Hello. <laughs> They, they only work if you punch them. Take it away. Okay, I will start. Okay. <laughs> See, it only works then. They, yes, they, they're working mostly. <laughs> but um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I can speak on behalf of St. John's Campus Ministry and um, the Eugene McCarthy Center. We are so excited that you all are here. We are super excited and blessed that we have Lino here with us as well as KSDZ. And um, I'll keep it pretty darn brief. But um, for those of you that found yourself here and you aren't exactly sure who, who, who this guy is right in front of you, um, Lino Ruli is a 93 graduate of St. John's, 95 graduate of the School of Theology. He's, I mean, he's done a few things. He won a couple of Emmys, like, you know, no big deal, I guess. Um, and he, he currently has, currently has um, the Catholic Guy radio show on Sirius XM. Um, he's written a couple books, which Anne will be selling in the back there. Um, and also throughout, don't feel shy about going and grabbing some of the food we have in the back. Um, and in a little bit here, we'll have time to ask questions, which this mic will just be right over here and you can feel free to ask questions in a little bit. But um, otherwise, thank you all for being here. And Lino, thank you for being here. And we will, I will let you guys take it away, so. You're starting. Okay, let's all close our eyes for a minute and imagine the confessional. <laughs> We're in the confessional and KSDZ is saying she's never done an interview she never even heard of Lino before this, and she's wondering why she was chosen to do this. And the priest responds, child, I hear you, do some penance, and here I am. <laughs> but it's an honor to be with you. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for um, rescheduling things in your lives to be with us. Um, I am excited to be up here with Lino. Um, the joke is I think Lino should interview me, not vice versa, but we're gonna start out that way anyways. How did um, St. John's and the School of Theology contribute to the Catholic Guy Show? There you go, how? No, you, I'm answering, you're, you're, I'm asking the questions. How, how, can, do you mind, I'll, I'll do the interview. How is being a Catholic in New York different than being a Catholic in Minnesota? How about in Boston? What have you learned this week on, on campus? Lots. <laughs> snow days happen. Yeah, uh, let me start with that. Uh, how on earth do you have a snow day in Minnesota? A snow day, it's, it's, it's five inches of snow, that's, that's called June. I couldn't believe that, I'm like, canceled events, canceled classes. In my day, this is where I get to be old. Back in my day, they never, they wouldn't cancel classes. They knew what we were going to do. I was, uh, so I'm happy to be here on a non-snow day. What were you going to do on a snow day? When I was in college, the <laughs> same thing I was going to do yesterday. What did you do yesterday on Looks a Looks a lot day? like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, jump in and tell us what we need to know about, seriously, um, how did we get to the Catholic guy? What, what are the three big moments that get us to the Catholic guy? Okay, what are the big moments that get us to the Catholic three. guy? Three, I only have three. Trinitarian. All right, let's see. The first was that when I was, uh, when I was a communications major here at St. John's, I got an internship at Channel 11, and, uh, and I realized I didn't want to get into news, in part because the anchor at the time was a guy by the name of Paul Majors. Paul had a great career, a million dollars a year, 10-year contract, nice strong jaw, and I realized that's not me. If guys with big noses were really gonna be the future of news anchors, I'd have a shot. But I knew that was not gonna be my profession. So when I realized communications wasn't gonna be what works for me, I decided to go to the only other thing that ever mattered to me when I was here at St. John's, and that was theology. So that's when I went and decided to get a master's degree in theology. So now I've got a communications degree in, I mean, undergrad in communications and a master's in theology, which basically makes me unemployable. So that's step one. 
Wait, can I interrupt? You just did. Yeah. Okay. Really, theology mattered to you. Mm. <laughs> I know it doesn't look like it, but yeah. Uh, Unpack well, that for me. Okay. Unpack that for me, given Robert Johnson. <laughs> so Robert Johnson is a, <clears throat> one of the chapters in my book. Um, I had a, when I was here on campus, I had a fake ID. I know, shocking. Um, <laughs> However, this was 1989. I was a freshman, Tommy Four, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm moving back. Uh, my friends, uh, I thought I was the dumb one. Turns out they were the dumb ones. <laughs> the way we made the fake ID was we took something about this big, and it was a piece of cardboard, and it said Nevada, <laughs> and we had the numbers, and we made a fake ID, and so you just stood in front of this life-size thing, they took a picture and laminated it. So every guy on my floor had the same name, same birth date, and we all happened to be from Nevada. Uh, the bouncers at Sal's, I don't know if they've changed much, but uh, the rules were a little looser back then. Uh, so how, how does a guy who you're saying is that yeah. dumb with his fake ID and been arrested a few times by the St. Yeah, Joseph what cops? what was it? And what was your favorite class? Oh, um, well, Dr. Richard Ice is here, and he was my communications professor for many years, so it would be tough to pick which of his classes were my favorite. That being said, uh, here's how I realized what was important to me, was that uh, my, come my senior year when I realized I didn't really want to get into broadcasting, which is odd since I've now been in broadcasting for 20 years, uh, I had to look back and say, what were the only classes I actually was interested in in, right. in school? And I hate math. I hate things I don't know. I'm bad at math, I'm bad at science, I'm bad at most everything. And it occurred to me, the only things I ever really enjoyed were the theology classes. Not because I was good at it, but I thought, well, this is really interesting. And unlike math, I have a calculator. There seem to be some applications to my life. Like when I die, who Jesus is might be something that's more important than just on an exam uh, for my life itself. That's step number one. Okay. Now. I, only have to, I can only do this in three steps. So, second step was... I could be lenient. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> the second step, more or less, was I, I lived out of the country for a few years. I moved back to Minnesota from Italy, what I expected to be for a few months. I was looking for a job. I, honest to God, went to Sunday Mass once, went up to a priest and said, I'm, uh, I'm Lino Rulli. I have an undergrad in communications, a, a master's in theology. I have no place to go. Will you hire me? Long story short, I ended up with a cable access TV show, which turned into a job being a reporter at Channel 4, which is ironic since I never wanted to be in news journalism, uh, which turned into a six-year television show, which turned into a television production company. That's step two. Step three was Sirius Satellite Radio was starting something called the Catholic Channel. They had just hired a guy named Howard Stern. Now, people our age know who Howard Stern is. I know a lot of college students I found out this week don't know who Howard Stern is. He's one of the most influential broadcasters in history. When he moved to Sirius, Sirius had 500,000 subscribers. When they signed him to a $100 million contract, five years, $500 million, his first day at work, Sirius suddenly had 6 million subscribers. We now have 35, no, yeah, 35 million paid subscribers. Wow. Uh, they were looking for a Catholic channel, but they needed to find somebody who could be as uh, random as Howard Stern, but still somehow Catholic. So I went out and did an interview because I wanted a free trip to New York. When I got there, they said, you're the guy. And though I'd never worked in radio, they said, if you come here, we'll teach you how to do radio. And that's, that's three easy steps into getting a national radio show. Well, and I mean, think about that journey you describe in the book, wanting to be on the David Letterman show. So that's a painful reminder. Um, Sorry. <laughs> the one thing that it didn't occur to me when I was here at St. John's as an undergrad, the one thing that never occurred to me until really later in life was that the things that are most interesting to you, God might have put those passions and interests in your heart for a reason but it never occurred to me, because I'm a kid watching Dave Letterman every night, and again, some of the college students are like, now, now which one is that? Uh, he used to have a late night talk show on CBS. Mm -hmm. 
He was one before Stephen Colbert. And uh, all I ever want, I just love David Letterman. It's all I ever really wanted to do was work for David Letterman, but I didn't know that was even a possibility. I didn't know that was a, an option at, in, at the time. And so years later, I realized I always loved TV. I always loved radio. I always loved God to a you know, lesser extent some days. But it never occurred to me you could put it all together. Right. And uh, so uh, looking back on it, I go, oh, it made the perfect sense that that's what I was doing with my life, was following that uh, career path. But I didn't know you could do that. And uh, I, I got to meet him last year. That's not in the book. No, it's not. Uh, so I got, to, I got to meet him last year and have an actual conversation with him and thank him for uh, putting me on the trajectory that went Catholic when I probably would have gone his direction if I knew it was a possibility. Um, talk to me about this second question. How is being a Catholic in New York? Well, so we're in New York now. We live in New York. No, this is Minnesota, isn't it? Well, we have snow days in uh, Minnesota. Well, you live in New York. Oh, yeah, now. yeah, yeah. You're based in New York. What's it like? It smells like urine. You know, the whole city. A lot more rats than in Minnesota, too. Uh, no, I'm serious. There's a lot of rats, a lot of urine. Uh, there's a lot of people. Holy cow. There's a lot uh, of people. I've lived here. in New York now 12, uh, more than 12 years. Here's how I know I've lived in New York for a long time is... Uh, you know, I got back here Sunday night, I'm walking on campus, people are saying hello, and I'm like grabbing for my wallet to see what they want. <laughs> like, clearly something's going, you don't say hello to a stranger if you're walking around. And no. You're walking on campus, somebody's like, hi. I'm like, jittery, like what, what are they gonna stab me? <laughs> uh, New York is interesting because growing up in Minnesota, I grew up, I'm born and raised Catholic, and to me that was it, you were Catholic. That, that was it. Like, we had uh, some Lutheran neighbors and their little Lutheran Jesus or whatever, but I was very unclear what was going on with their church and what on earth was happening. <laughs> like, I had no exposure to any right. other Christian denominations, let alone people of different faiths or no faith. That just wasn't my, it wasn't right. in my uh, wheelhouse. So, you know, living in New York now especially, I think it's rather cool because it lets you figure out what you want to believe or not what you want to believe because there's plenty to do other than go to church on Sunday. You know, right. there, are, there are other opportunities. And so the fact that so many people are going to church, but New York is just a, a, it's bigger than everything. New York City tries to kill you every single day I have found. Whether it's the subway or the food or the rats or actual terrorists, New York is always trying to kill you. And sometimes the church is the only safe place to go. And uh, so being a New York Catholic, there's just more cursing than there is in Minnesota. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of guilty because I'm a Boston Catholic. Um, you have a lot of cursing in Boston. I, I know. Um, my <laughs> students can attest to that. <laughs> right? I do have tenure, Dr. Rice. <laughs> right? Yeah. By the way, this tenure thing is the greatest thing going. I got it. If we could do this in broadcasting, like any day, I could make a joke. I can say something. They could fire me. <laughs> if I got tenured, oh, they got to they gotta replicate this in the other parts of the world. Seriously. <laughs> that would be the greatest thing in the world. Can you imagine if you're a broadcaster, you're tenured? Oh, good for you. <laughs> oh, it'd be the best. True. Um, tell it me also explains some of the professors I had when I was an undergrad, by the way. I'm like... <laughs> Oh, you got nothing to lose, bud. Now to, uh, it made sense later on in life. I'm like, no wonder you were so bad. But again, Dr. Ice, that's all changed, I know. But we don't have that kind of nonsense nowadays. So, do you want funny things or do you want to... Let's do funny things. Yeah, so I... What, you got jokes? No, because oh. I'm not funny. Okay. Okay. Um, so tell me... Well, first of all, what's your favorite 80s jam? This is going to tell me a lot about you and whether or not I'm going to like you. All right. You got to think long and hard Boy, here. A lot I'm of, oozing lot of the pressure. answer to you. Well, here's the thing. What do you want to listen to? Uh, uh, I used to be a DJ at Sal's. Of course you were. So, uh, what 80s, else should I know? <laughs> 80s jam has a lot of ideas to it because I, because <laughs> I'm a Motley Crue guy. Okay, keep talking. But at the same time, rap was coming in, yeah, so I'm a Beastie Boys yes. guy. Oh, okay. No Sleep Till Brooklyn. 
I agree. That's oh. why I stay in Manhattan. I don't want to go over to Brooklyn. They don't sleep well. I got to get my rest. Uh, yeah, well, I'm a Beastie Boys guy. Uh, it for was the college forbidden students, for me to listen to um, Beastie Boys, though. Why? Was it forbidden for you? No. No, that's Are you the Amish. Dis- um, no gender discrepancy. Girls don't listen to Beastie Boys. I was like, why not? Listen to the Beastie Girls. I don't know. It never occurred to me. <laughs> the first album I ever bought was License to Ill, 1987. We have a lot in common. And like, I, I got to explain to the college students what we're talking about here. Yeah. If you go on YouTube <laughs> and look up Beastie Boys, there will be a bunch of white guys rapping. And you'll be like, is this Eminem's dad? But it, it was really, it's really quality. And, and Motley is. Crue, by the way. It, anybody know who Motley Crue is? Even recognize this? Oh, yeah, my parents used to listen to that. Um, this is how much the world has changed. This is how much high school, college, everything has changed. Motley Crue put out a song called Smoking in the Boys' Room. That was revelation. Oh, my. Oh, look at, the, look at that. They're smoking cigarettes in the boys' room. How controversial. Things have changed. That's my point. Hey, yeah. Um, what's the hookup song by... Um, what's his name? Blurred Lines. We go from Smoking in the Boys' Room to Blurred Lines. Robin... Uh, what's his Robin face? Thicke. Yeah. There we go. We only know that because uh, Robin Thicke's dad used to be famous. Alan Thicke yeah. had a, te- a late night television show and he had a, a sitcom. Yes. And then his son oh, what was that? blurred lines. And, uh... In many ways. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, okay, if they made a movie about your life, who would play you? And Ralph why? Macchio. Oh. <laughs> um, Wait, everybody knows who Ralph Macchio is, right? No, because the demographics are too shifted. Did you, Karate Kid, you Karate can watch Kid, it on yes. YouTube but, Red. Right, so there's Karate Kid. Ralph Macchio, Ralph, yes. Yeah, I know. I was trying to answer this question for you, and I couldn't think, but you're absolutely right. I know me better than you do, because we just <laughs> you, met. You're right. I, I'm sorry I had the answer so quickly. No, okay, last funny one. And oh, last we'll, funny, oh, for the love, this is it? That This is the fun? Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, if you're stranded, Hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. If you're stranded on a desert island, which three items would you bring with you? Think Survivor, and you get to bring three items. A boat, a captain, and gasoline. <laughs> that should get me home in time. What would you bring? I don't know. I was being really practical. Like, I was thinking... No, I think I was being really I, practical. Well, I'm getting I the hell know. out of there. <laughs> I know. You're, you're I just know. like, oh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'll like, have well, soup. Well, I, I want a knife. I, I mean, I'm... Knife? A, I, the hell? I'm going to, I'm thinking I'm going to live there. I'm going to be prepared. I'm, well, yeah. it's not a deserted island. You just decided to get away from your family then. You're just oh. like, well, I don't want to be here anymore. Well, bring a house. Apparently you're staying. I, I, I thought the point was we wanted to leave, not we wanted to stay. I, I know, bring I'm, satellite I'm radio. I'm thinking castaway. I'm thinking castaway. Tom Hanks and I've, I've got to like stay. And oh. what do I need to survive? A volleyball. <laughs> I mean, I saw the movie. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh. All right, folks. I hope you've enjoyed the entertainment portion of the evening. We're now getting to the serious stuff. If you didn't find that part fun, hmm. I don't know how to do this. Uh, Sounds like my wedding night. I thought you were supposed to... So speaking of controversial That's what I thought about. This is what I heard. I'm like, oh, she likes talking about sex and relationships. I know. I said speaking, speaking of controversial topics. What do you want to jump into? Not bed, but... <laughs> I don't see that. I, uh, again, sounds like my wife's reaction to our wedding night. I'm, I'm here. I don't, I don't know. I'm not getting paid for this. Uh-huh. Oh. I get paid for my radio um, show. I focus on so that. So a lot of what I do in the classroom and a lot of what I think we're dealing with is trying to balance what society is telling our students and the faith and the family and the background that our students come to us with. And really, there's a lot of confusion. How do you sort through the messages? How do you sort through um, a different way of communicating, right? I mean, our students have so much access to information, information that we never had access to, right? right? Um, what What are three values? What are three things? that you think students should try to hold on to in this day and age? Like, wh- what a are- boat, uh, <laughs> a captain. I'm, I'm sorry, this three-time thing really got me. Uh, three values. Yeah, like, 
like as as we as we try to go forward, as even as you, I mean, I think you describe your journey very very openly, very honestly. That no one's going to do this perfect, right? We're talking um, about tonight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everybody is going to have to. Everybody faces challenges. Everybody faces struggles. I don't think we do a good job of openly discussing those. I think we're a perfectionist society and we hide behind masks and we hide behind walls. And we don't really share our sufferings. We, share, we don't really share our journeys with people. And how, how, would we, how would we try to live out this faith journey and this journey of struggle yet compassion in life in a world that says it cares but doesn't really seem to care? Because well, you're just a snap, you're just a photo, you're just a, a one-word answer. I know I am, but I, uh, I'm the right person to ask, because I've never thought of this question. So let's go through this together, shall we? Okay, yeah, let's uh, go. Here's what I think uh, society needs more, here's what I think the church needs more, and uh, it's a transparency of how flawed we are. So what I have found, and I guess that's virtue one, that's value one. Yeah. yeah write these down. These will be very I, these important. These are good, actually. Plus, this will be helpful for me when I forget what I was at when I'm at number three. Uh, what I have found rather strange or remarkable in the uh, number of years, for instance, I've just had a radio show, I'm shocked at the number of people who are shocked at me being honest about what a flawed Christian I am. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, well, You're also because, shocked that they're shocked. No, yes, I'm it's... open and honest about my flaws. Right. So I am surprised because the, the one thing we all have in common is we are all completely screwed up. And it's so weird that we know we're screwed up and we know that other people are screwed up, but somehow we don't admit I'm screwed up, you're screwed up, uh, we're all screwed up together. Mm -hmm. And so I've always, I found it really weird that I have a National Catholic radio show and people freak out if I talk about times I doubted God. And yeah, people freak right. out at times that I'm very annoyed at God or very mad at God. Because the answer is, well, that's not what you're supposed to be like. Right. And I'm like, but actually it is what I'm supposed to be like. Well, first of all, it is who I am. And then secondly, is that who you are? Well, yeah, but I don't think it's helpful to tell people that. So I think the church uh, uh, is transitioning. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if society is transitioning or not in our leaders. But I know the church, I think, is getting to transition more and more from a place where popes were carried uh, on chairs 60 years ago. And nothing wrong with that, by the way. I'd like to bring that back for radio hosts, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, be very pleased if people just walked around with a, carry me on a chair. To Pope Francis in his first interview as pope with a, a, a priest by the name of Father Antonio Spadaro, who said, now, who are you? And the pope's first answer was, I'm a sinner. Right. Now, I think that's a value that has value, because when you hear the Pope say it, I don't even think my grandparents' generation thought of the Pope as a sinner. And um, he was. So that's the first value. Have we written that one down? Yep, transparency. transparency in that, okay. Yep. Uh, can we just make that all three? <laughs> I gotta think about the other two. No, that was the I first one actually, that came to mind. I, I mean, I don't think we can talk enough about that. Well then the second one otherwise would be information. Yeah, say more. The, uh, uh, I, I, in one of the st uh, classes I was at earlier this week, uh, uh, the professor said, does anybody have any questions? And a woman uh, uh, raised her hand. And her first question was, well, I was reading your bio on Wikipedia. And I'm like, no, no, that's like a crowdsourcing thing. Like, uh, she was like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, and her question was, uh, you know, I, I read your uh, Italian-American, so are you from Sicily? And I said, well, no, uh, I'm Italian. Um, Italy is kicking Sicily, so that, that's how you know. It's like we're trying to distance ourselves. We're like, no, 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 go further away. So as she's asking me questions about Italy, I'm going, so you don't know anything about me, which is fine, but uh, your information is from Wikipedia. I don't even create that Wikipedia page, and some listeners have created it for me, and they screw around with me all the time. Some days they make me 65 years old. Uh, one day my biography said I... I'm an Emmy Award winner, a radio host, and an astronaut. So I also feel like there's a value in a lack of information, mm -hmm. and fake news has become a running joke. Right. But uh, everything is fake news, or everything is confusing fake news if you don't actually know what sources are. Yep. And this happens, obviously it happened in politics, but it happens in the church 
constantly, and it's unbelievable to me how people simply don't have their facts and just put information out there. I read stuff about me all the time. Uh, I, I work for Cardinal Dolan, who's the Archbishop of New York. He posted something on, his people posted something on uh, uh, his Facebook earlier this week. And people were complaining, 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 and somebody wrote, well, Lino Rulli runs his social media, and I only know that because they tagged my name. So I'm reading all these people, well, Lino's horrible. Well, I used to listen to his show. I'm not going to listen anymore. And I'm like, I don't even run his social media. Like, none, of this, none of this conversation is true. It's all inf information people are consuming, thinking they're actually consuming information. And I'm like, I'm not going to feed the trolls so I don't go into right. it. But like, there's a value that is like, yep. information used to be something you valued. And now, uh, uh, even the New York Times gets questioned as right. if that's real news or not. Well, and I think what I try to, to me, what I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to bring something back. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, for the longest time, I've called it dating. Um, I, I'm trying to get people to, when they think about healthy personal relationships, to put the screen down. And I'm trying to get them to talk face to face because if you talk to somebody face to face, then you can start to gather more clear information versus trying to do all this stuff. Yeah, with oh, my like, face, I would not, uh, I prefer things not with my face. So I think if I was in the internet dating world, You're not helping me. I would have been on Tinder like with a different picture, but. Uh, <laughs> and how uh, would that be helpful? Well, it's probably why I, I got married at the age of 44 is because there was too much face-to-face -face contact in my life. I think I would have been better off. But I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Let me check my phone quick yeah. in case anybody's texted me recently. Okay. Uh. Did you see those daggers? Yes. Okay, good. Good. Do you want a third one? I I'm trying to think of a third value. Well, here, th th this, this might be something... Um... I've got one. Oh, well, that's, this is my Go third one. Go with justice. Okay. What would you say? Uh, justice. Meaning what? I don't know. You said it. I don't know. <laughs> or give me another. Give me a third value. Okay. Here's a third. Uh, I'm not good with the values, but here's something that I love about being Catholic in 2019 that I think is different than being Catholic in 1989 or 1919. <laughs> I think it's so great and this is probably going to sound strange coming from the Catholic guy here. I am on a Catholic campus. Uh, the value of actually having your own belief system. The value mm -hmm. of not taking what your parents have given you or what society wants you to have. Um, I love that there... I, I think 400 years ago, being an atheist uh, uh, brought shame or some sort of a... Right. Uh, there was something wrong with you. I love the more options you've got when it, when it comes to... You want to be an atheist? Go be an atheist. You want to not be a Catholic anymore? Go do whatever. I think, I think that there's a value in actually then finding it for yourself and keeping it for yourself. Yes. And I love it that I'm like, yep, I can do anything I want in the world. I can, I can believe anything I want. Nobody's going to judge me in the sense of, oh, well, I think that's great. Because then the values I have are actually my Catholic values. And they're not because the churches impose them on me or societies impose them. I get to have them because they're my actual values. Well, and would, wouldn't you say that that's been the process, like a journey over time to figure, I out would that, say that. to figure out that moral compass? Because I think one of the things we try to do on this campus is to say to students, it, it's different when you show up here at 18. There, there's nobody... There's no parental structure watching over you. You get to meet all these new people with new ideas, right? Um, I think what I want for the students is to not only be engaging in that journey to developing and forming their moral compass and figuring that, that journey out for themselves, but I, I just said to my students today, I don't want you to be afraid though, and, and this is my big concern, I don't want you to be afraid to talk to somebody who's different than you. Right. Right? Um, because I see the lack of dialogue as very concerning. Right? Um, I'm going to stick with my people over here. You're going to stick with your people over here. And we're not going to really dialogue face to face about the experiences of why are you over here 
and why am I over here? Um, and, and why it's okay. Why it's okay to doubt, to question, to disagree in a respectful manner, right. and to have those controversial dialogues with each other. And I don't think they even have to be controversial. So uh, though I have a national Catholic radio show, my executive producer is an atheist. And he's what? on the air with me. And it's fantastic because I have so many Catholic friends, and there are some people in the Catholic world who believe that you can simply, uh, from an intellectual point of view, bring an atheist. Oh, if they only understood uh, right. this about Catholicism, then they'd no longer be an atheist. This guy's on the air with me every day. This guy came to the Holy Land with me. I do pilgrimages uh, four or five times a year all over the world. We go to the Holy Land a couple times a year. He came with me to the Holy Land last year. Right. Do you think he had one inkling, anything closer to Jesus Christ? No. And he didn't even like hummus. It was a disaster on right. every level. <laughs> but th that to me is, and I love him. He loves being on the air. He is just a part of the show. He does not believe the way I believe. Right. And this concept that I could persuade him, or for that matter, that he could persuade me, he's learned a lot, too, because I think he always saw Christians. He always thought of Catholics anti-science, anti-intellectual, anti-fun. Right. Uh, anti you know, the more he goes, wait a second. You know, Lino and I share a same bookie, <laughs> and yet... Uh, we have all these things in common where we differ is I believe in God, I believe in the incarnation, I believe in everything the Catholic Church teaches, Catholic Church teaches, and he doesn't think God exists. Right. Uh, but it's a conversation. Yep. And it's a conversation every day that I'm not afraid of having, he's not afraid of having, and I'm not trying to change him, and he's not trying to change me. Can I be done talking and turn it over to you? I'd like to say the same thing. We could just... Yeah. No, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm on the clock, I know. So I'm willing to run into... Or do you want me to run the mic to people? Like, no. So, so what we're... So make your questions short. I'm going to stand, too. This is presuming people have questions. I'm going to start with a question. Oh, that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> so this is not a plug for your book, even though I would love to make one. Um, but the title of, I think it's your second book, is it Saint? Why should be canonized right away? Yeah. So I'll read the book eventually, but why should you be canonized? <laughs> Just so you know, the advance came in years ago. <laughs> we covered that advance a long time ago. So the, the, you know, the, 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 the royalty I get is going to be next to nothing. All right. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. It's all right. So why should you be canonized right away? <laughs> All right, this is a good question. I get to go first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, no, I, I thought the question no, was for that, me. That was, for, that was for both. Uh, no. Go ahead. Go, I, I got the answer. I'm facetious. I want to be canonized first. Go ahead. I'm going to be Pope first. You go. <laughs> I'm going to call my bookie on that one. <laughs> Give me odds. I think I'm going to make a little extra cash, just like the Patriots. Uh, Oh, I cleaned up on that team. Thank God those Patriots won the Super Bowl. Oh, Am I okay. right? Yeah, oh, okay. I was wondering. Oh, where they you covered go the with spread. This. I knew they were going to cover the spread. That okay. was no. That was a no-brainer. Okay. Um, count on me. I know my betting. Uh, what was the question? Oh, yes. This is exactly why I think I should be canonized right away. I think the church, who I love, church leaders that I love, have made a fatal flaw of the last couple of decades in who they've canonized. And what I mean by that is this. It's rarely people who look like us, and I'm not saying uh, mm. big-nosed, greasy Italians. What I'm saying is we got those. Uh, but we oftentimes have founders of religious orders. We have priests. We have bishops. We have popes. My point being, when you look in the mirror, you don't see a saint. You see a sinner. When you look... I, and by the way, and I'm not, you know, when I go to St. Peter's Basilica and I get to go to canonizations and I cover it on the air, John Paul II's canonization, fantastic, I'm a big fan, but I have nothing in common with him. Right. What about the everyday person? Uh, so how, you know, if you go, hey, wait a minute, Lino is not a very good Catholic. Lino is a guy who I knew back in college and is still a moron today. This is a guy who is not what I would expect but keeps going to church, keeps trying to go to confession, keeps practicing the Catholic faith, though he clearly is not very good at it. He keeps doing this. 
that's the type of person I want to see canonized because that's the type of person that gives me hope. So I'd made the whole thing tongue in cheek about me, but it was really about if you're a single mom, do you see a lot of canonized saints that you go, she gets it? No, I mean, you, you know, you don't. And so you're like, you know, the, I'm not criticizing virgin martyrs, but, uh, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be canonized, right. but the more virgin expand, martyrs expand the, view. the church holds up as she should, the less we think we're going to be canonized. Right. So you know the best way to be canonized is become a pope, but is the best way to be canonized to just get married, have kids, hold a job, you don't run off and, and quit everything and serve the poor even though Jesus would like you to. You're, you're living your life and you're raising kids. Is, is that the norm of ca canonizations in the Catholic Church? Well, no, because you don't have enough contacts with people in Rome who are going to be able to open up the cause for canonization. And so I'm not against the ones who are being canonized. Right. It's a both and. And so the whole joke was, why not me? I should be canonized right away because you need more people who are not good at being Catholic, who you can really relate to and go, wait a minute, if Lino's actually a Catholic and got canonized, there's actually hope for me. Now you can be canonized. Thank you. Who's next? Good. Well, that wraps up our evening. We hope you enjoyed your... Uh... Go ahead. Okay. So you're in Prague. Uh, um, and you talk about flaws and transparency and how to have dialogue. And so I'm wondering um, how do you talk about the hard subject of at least the Catholic Church right now, which is sexual abuse and church hierarchy? How do you start conversations about that? So the question is, how do you start? I have a quick follow up for you, and I know you didn't think I'd be asking you questions. Uh, how do you cover hard topics, be it sex abuse or church hierarchy? How do you have discussion? Are you saying as a broadcaster? Are you saying at a bar? Are you saying with family? I can do everything. Good. <laughs> Guess I could have figured that out on my own. <laughs> as a perspective of a broadcaster and then someone who represents a very significant figure in the church, or helps represent, and then like your own, your own. So we'll start with as a broadcaster. Uh, I don't cover it at all on the Catholic Guy Show, and the reason I don't cover it is because. Uh, just like it says in the Bible, there's a, a for every season, turn, turn, turn. For every show and for every channel, for people not to turn, turn, turn the channel, you don't want to always bring up these topics. So I do an entertainment show. My show is about being Catholic. It's about the Catholic faith, but it's entertainment. You're there to have a laugh, and we have to find places where you go, this isn't the place for this. Uh, my criticism of late-night talk shows is there was a time with Johnny Carson, again, Sorry, kids. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know what that is. But there was a guy before Jimmy Fallon, and I know you only know him from YouTube, but <laughs> before Jimmy Fallon, if Jimmy Fallon had a grandpa, his name was Johnny Carson. And Johnny Carson had, had a popular late-night talk show, also the only late-night talk show because there was nothing else on any other network. And Johnny Carson went out of his way. He was like, people come here to have something in common. And if I bring up okay, I'll make a joke about this president, but if I criticize too much, we're going to pull people apart. Now, I love Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert is a practicing Catholic, but his show become too political. Mm -hmm. He's taken, and he's gone number one because of it, but by going political, he's dividing, and you go, no, no, that's not supposed to be the place for divisiveness. This is supposed to be a place for comedy. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Foo Fighters fan. Yeah? yeah? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. All right. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with him, he was the drummer in a band called Nirvana. Uh, they don't put out music anymore. I'm not sure what happened to them. But uh, Dave started out a really good band called Foo Fighters. And Dave uh, politically is liberal. But Dave, as a rock star, says, people aren't coming here to do politics. They're coming here to have a good time, to sing. And so for three hours at one concert, if I can be bringing people together, forgetting everything they don't have in common, uh, but what they do have in common. So that's what my show is supposed to be. It's like, you're Catholic, you're not Catholic, you're conservative, you're liberal, whatever it is, I want this show to be for you. Uh, when it comes to, so that's, that, I don't talk about the, those topics. When it comes to 
every time another story on sex abuse comes out, you know, CNN and MSNBC and places I've appeared a lot of times for more positive things always ask me, and I always say no, because uh, one of the things you learn the hard way is I used to say yes to every national TV appearance because I wanted to be on national TV. And then you fail enough times and you say, what are my strengths versus what are my weaknesses? I can go on and make a joke on TV. There seem to be less places for jokes in that topic. So it's like, you know what? I appreciate you asking me. There's going to be somebody who's better than me at that because it takes you a long time to get to what am I actually good at? Where am I valuable? So I can be valuable on CNN when the Pope was being elected. So I was on with a guy named Piers Morgan, who's now been fired, but don't blame me. Uh, I was his Vatican correspondent, right? So there I am in Rome every night, cracking jokes about who the next Pope will be. The night the Pope is elected, I'm on national TV cracking jokes about the new Pope, because earlier that day I was on the radio saying uh, Cardinal Bergoglio would not be named Pope, uh, and that was not the future of the church. So you get to, right. he lost the election in 2005. He's 76 years. I didn't think he was going to win, that's all. Uh, so I don't bring those topics up in broadcasting, um, and, and, and that's for me. Now, in terms of conversations with friends or with family and everything else, there's really nothing to say but your own feelings, and those feelings oftentimes have curse words involved with that. And to me, horrible leadership says nothing about the Catholic Church other than horrible leaders. And horrible leaders in government don't say anything about America to me. You can have a horrible leader, and it doesn't make me believe any less in America. I can have a horrible bishop or cardinal, and it doesn't mean I don't believe in the Catholic Church. It means that person's horrible. So that's how I deal with it. What were you going to ask? No, I, I asked her, like, if it was going to be about broadcasting oh, okay. or interpersonal. Okay. And, and half the things that I really think I couldn't say on TV because they'd keep bleeping me. <laughs> when it comes to these topics, that is. Take a stab at it. Say something. Good. How has the Benedictine identity of St. John's informed your show? How has the Benedictine... Identity of St. John's informed my show. It's a good question because I know 99% of the audience wouldn't understand that question. And so I, I work very hard to answer questions on the air in a way that people would understand. They don't know what Benedictine values are. They don't know who Benedict is. They don't know what Aura et Labora is. I was on the air last week with a priest friend of mine, diocesan priest out of New Jersey very Sopranos-esque like. And I said, you know, the Benedictines, uh, aura, et, and he's like, <laughs> like he didn't know there was another word coming after that, you know, the priest 19 years. It's like, okay. Um, St. John's, for better or worse, I don't think anybody wants to take blame for me, uh, but made me who I am. And I can't even put the words to it. It's, it's the people. It's the experience, you know, it's the, it's the learning what it really means to be Catholic because uh, I think today more than ever, and if I'm wrong, I'll let you know. Well, they'll put it on Wikipedia too. Uh, I think today more than ever, people love defining what it means to be something. No, I'll tell you what it means to be American. I'll tell you what it means to be Catholic. I'll tell and the more that happens, the more I kind of go, no, 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 no. That, that, isn't how the, that, that isn't how life works. That isn't how society is. Certainly not how the church works. And so when somebody might say, oh, yes, well, this is what it would look like to be a Benedictine, what I say is, no, this is what the experience here has informed me. Uh, uh, because based on the monks, based on the hospitality, based on the intellectual tradition, based on work, that's what taught me. But I couldn't label them uh, individually of what the Benedictine values were that made me. But when I come back to a place like this, and I'm reminded of this all the time, especially working inside the church and inside church baseball, is there are a lot of people who think they know what it means to be Catholic. And I've been, I've, I spent enough years here to go, no, no, no. You've got a very simple understanding and it's a lot more nuanced and it's a lot more complicated than you want it to be.
Good answer. Thank you. Are you going to review then each time I answer? If it, <laughs> oh, that answer was no good, try again. I think you learned to listen here. What's that? I think you learned to listen here. It's a joke. Yeah. These are the jokes. I know we said we weren't going to have any more See, fun, I but... I don't catch any of this stuff. Go ahead. Uh, about that Sicilian uh, situation, <coughs> my parents came to Sicily. Yes. And I always thought of myself as Italian. I think I'm going to tell you more. So her question is about that Sicilian reference I made. Uh, her parents came from Sicily, and my condolences, and... Uh, <laughs> You said, I'm, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. No, on paper, you're not wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like Guam. I mean, we don't exactly know how that fits to America. You know, we're like, I mean, Guam is Guam, right? And weren't they like, gonna, wasn't North Korea going to attack it? And we all felt bad, but at the same time, weren't sure how we were connected. We were like, well, don't do that, but I don't really know any Guamites. So I guess if it has to be that part of America, Sicily, it's fine. It's just fine. No, it's cute. It's, I like how we're kicking it around, and it's fine. No, it's good. Sicily's a great place to visit. <laughs> it, fantastic. Have you ever been? Yeah. Amazing churches, great people. It's like Naples on steroids. <laughs> and nobody wants to see Naples on steroids. No, you know what the, the, you know what, what the problem with the Sicilians is? Is these Sicilians and these... Uh, uh, people from Naples, they all moved to the America, they all moved to the East Coast, and, uh, and, and that's how we got the Sopranos. So now nobody knows how to speak Italian anymore because uh, instead of prosciutto, which is your, your ham, they call it brojute. Well, no, you're ruining the language. And they got words like gabagool for capicola. Gabagool? Gabagool doesn't exist. Mozzarella. And they call it mutz. So you're people. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're your people. You came up and you screwed the whole thing up. They don't talk like that. Well, they're refined Sicilians. Okay, give me another good one. Go ahead. All right, so this isn't as serious, but uh, as a fellow Tommy Four resident, I would like to know what your favorite memory of Tommy Four was. And what room you're in. Uh, okay, so as a uh, fellow Tommy Four resident, my favorite memory and what room I'm in. Uh, I'm not there anymore. Uh, <laughs> haven't visited in 30 years, because that'd be weird. Sup, boys? How you doing? Walking canvas. Sup? Nice to be back in. Uh, <laughs> One of my very first memories was I, I'm from St. Paul, and and for me this is the sticks. For me this is the countryside, and one of my uh, first memories as a city slicker was coming up near my first day of college and walking uh, down campus and there was this uh, man, we were boys, uh, I mean he was a freshman as well, but he was a man. He had this cut off shirt and he had hair everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and as I'm walking to him and he's coming this direction, he goes, howdy. I'm like, what the hell, uh, what is that? Um, he became one of my best friends, his mom's actually here tonight, but. <laughs> Uh, it was one of my first memories because I remember thinking, well, now what is this experience going to be like? Uh, another experience I really, a favorite memory of that campus was, I think they were building this place. Anybody know when they built Sexton, when they started? Early 90s? 89, do you think they put any bricks out? It's too early maybe. So they had a building project going on and we, um, we weren't drinking because that would have been wrong. <laughs> and we wouldn't have bought it in the liquor locker in Avon, because is Bruce still there? <laughs> Bruce is still there? Oh, God, I got to go back and visit him. <laughs> Good for him. Uh, uh, I remember him going back to the fake ID. <laughs> By the time I was actually legally drinking, he's like, how old are you now? I'm like, eh, it's a long story. And then I'm in grad school still buying beer. He's like, what is happening? Um, so we weren't doing that. That'd be wrong. But I remember there was a building construction site right around here, and there were a bunch of bricks. And we, uh, uh, there was a kid in his room, and, and we took the bricks and blocked up his room so that when he opened the door, he just simply couldn't leave and couldn't do anything about it. And, and again, I know it's difficult to imagine because this is before the days of the internet, so he couldn't just put on Facebook or Snapchat, this sucks. Uh, 
He just had to yell until somebody cared, and nobody did. So uh, I, he might still be there. I don't remember. I, I don't know if we ever let him out, <laughs> but uh, 406 would have been his room number. I was 410, so I, I remember the muffled cries for help of... No, he, he, they let him out. He graduated. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody else? Over there. So as a senior, it's a little too late for me, but what advice do you have for underclassmen? No, first of all, that's, okay, the question was, as a senior, it's too late for him, but what advice do I have for underclassmen? Why is it too late for you? Why have we given up hope? That, <laughs> You're supposed to give up hope when you... We got two months. We got two months. You got two months. You can. You can. You can. What, what, if he said, if I could change my life in two months, I would. What's your major? Biochemistry. Biochemistry. I can't do nothing for you, man. <laughs> I have no idea. You, 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 put, you put yourself in. What's your name? Uh, Taylor. Todd Taylor. Now that's a, yeah, that's right. When, when I was in college, there, well, that didn't exist. We, we didn't have guys named Taylor. <laughs> we didn't. The guy's named Doug. You know what I mean? Paul. Hey, Paul, Phil, how are you? Uh, Taylor, see, now, what are you, 22, 21? 22. Yeah, of course, because you're Taylor. Now, no, this is, a, this is a generational thing. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're right. We didn't have you're Taylors. We right? Did not we have didn't have Taylors. Taylors. No. I like Taylors. Uh, Taylors are great. I got we no problem with Taylors. We didn't have Taylor. Kevins. Kevins. We had Kevins. I don't think so. Okay. We had St. Kevins, so there were Kevins. True. All right. Uh, now, now, biochemistry, are we planning to become. Doc, you're going to be a doctor. Oh, yeah, wait till the regrets of residency start. Don't start with your regrets now. Uh, no, no, you're on path. You're, you're, all right, so I, here's my advice to undergrads, but here's the advice that I'm giving you anyway, all right? Do you believe in God? And I don't care if you do or not. Yeah, I work with campus ministry. Oh, you work with campus ministry? Well, you work in campus ministry. I know plenty of people who work for the church. I'm not sure they believe in God. So the groans come from people who've not worked in the church. So... Uh, here's what I'd say. Uh, this is quoting Pope Francis. God is a God of surprises. And mm. so uh, when I was two months out of graduation, I had no idea what I'd be doing with my life. I certainly didn't imagine it was going to be anything resembling the last 20 years. I never thought I would be a guy who would get to meet heroes of mine, whether it be Pope John Paul II or David Letterman. These are all, what? It's just quite a span. Oh, well. <laughs> I have, oh, oh. When, uh, I did not do it. I have the same span, don't worry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, to me, the th so I would never have guessed it. So, so the first thing I would say is, uh, wait until you're in your 40s to give up hope. That's where I'm at right now. You're way too young to give up hope. What? 45. Oh, you gave up, didn't you? No. Oh, okay, well, you should have. I'm uh, here. I'm living the dream. I thought that was proof you gave up as you're here. So, so uh, uh, like I was saying earlier, like I was a junior communications. I thought broadcasting was me my whole career. I decided to switch gears altogether, and I decided to do what I thought was the right thing to do. I thought, oh, I'm going to be a serious Catholic. And to be Catholic means not working in broadcasting, not doing a thousand other things. It means working for the church. And God surprised me by saying, no, I'm not letting you get away with it. This, and, and every time I even try to do something different, because I'd like to make money or something, God keeps me where I'm at. And so the, the piece of advice for you is, okay, yeah, you're two months out. You have no idea what's coming your way. Not at all. And be open to that, because maybe you're not supposed to be a doctor. Like, I mean, I know you, it sucks you went to biochemistry for no reason, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it seems like a drag. You could have taken an easy major like I took, communications. Oh. But, uh, so first of all, don't do that. Secondly, then for the undergrads, uh, certainly the same idea of being open to everything, but the one thing that I didn't do that I wish I had was experienced all that I could. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I spent a lot of nights drinking schlitz, and whatever nasty beer Dale was selling at Sal's, we used to be calling them orange whips. I don't know if he sells them anymore. Um, I spent a lot of my time trying to save money on beer. And, hey, is that keg bad? Yeah, <laughs> bring it over. Uh, I wish I would have spent more time uh, doing the things a university allows you to do outside of your comfort zone, study abroad, 
meeting people and doing things with people who you just didn't think you ever would. And in fact, a lot of the stuff I've done after graduating was a reaction to the time I wasted here. So I moved to the Bahamas, I moved to Italy. I did a bunch of things because I realized some of my time here was wasted, because I was. <laughs> and <laughs> and if, I, if I look to, I, boy, I wish I would have done it. I would, I would not have had any less fun, but uh, a friend of mine who we looked at at the time and we weren't sure what he was up to, he would have just as much fun as us, but he used to always go to this place called the library. And he would be at the library from 7 to 9 p.m., 7 to 10 p.m., or some nights even earlier than that. And then he would meet us at Sal's. Then he would come and have a few drinks. And it's probably not a coincidence that the guy who took his faith seriously, took his education seriously, and took his faith seriously, uh, and uh, uh, what, uh, fun seriously, is, is probably the, my friend who was the only successful guy I knew out of college, when he became President Obama's chief of staff, that's Dennis McDonough. So uh, when we looked at him, we're like, dude, because we called him dude, not because we just said dude, his nickname was dude. We're like, dude, why are you always studying? Turns out if you want to have a career, <laughs> that's the way to go. So that would be the only other piece is let God surprise you, but take every opportunity that this university provides you, not because you know your future, because you think you know your future, because you want to see what the future holds. And uh, uh, I hope the doctoring thing works. <laughs> Let's give Lino. That was a fantastic ending. I love that.